It's Factory 5, Facebook Live. It's supposed to be 2 o'clock. We had a small battery issue. Um, today we're going to talk about 427 versus 289. Now this is not an FE. This is a 351 Windsor that you heard. I got a 289 over here. And what we're going to do is we're going to do body style per body style. Go over the changes between each one. I know I did this before, but it's such a nice day out. We can get the cars out. And nothing's like a Cobra on a day like today. So if you got questions, Dave's going to shout them out. I don't think we're going to take much time, but we're going to go over the details right up front so you can kind of see the difference. Now, someone asked on the, uh, the post today, what's our sales? And, and what I said was 10 427s for every single 289. So right off the bat, what does that tell you? The 427 is king. The 427 body style is the most popular. The 427 SC, they made about 30 of them. That was the most famous of the 1,000 or so, 900 or so covers made. So. It's, it makes a lot of sense the 427 is the king. It's also the one we've had in production the longest. Now, the 289, it's kind of what I like to say is it's kind of like the saber to the broadsword. And that was from Steve Temple. He told me that quote a long time ago. But it's really true. It's more of a, it's more of a gentleman's car. And when we decided to make a 289 version, we looked at our 427s, our best seller. We wanted to kind of do something more along the race side. And, uh, and if the wind noise is bad, you guys let Dave know. I can speak up. Um, I really wanted to get outside today because it's such a nice day. The next couple days are going to be raining. Um, but let's go through the two cars, at least from the body standpoint. We'll look at the drivetrain and the engine and kind of listen to the two different cars. I might take them for a little bit of a drive. Once this virus clears and Mad Dog and I can go, you know, pilot and co-pilot, we can go tear up the neighborhood and go try to get arrested. But for today, let's look at the exterior body. So with the 427 that we had went through four iterations. And what I did is I set the two cars up side by side. So Dave, you can look at the nose of each one. We can go over the fender flares, the hood scoops, the roll bar patterns, the gas cap, all the stuff that makes the two cars different. But let me say it this way. The Mark I Roadster. Do you guys remember the perky butt? Anybody? Just chime in. I know Sten has a perky butt. Your car, Sten, has a perky butt. Um, I actually think the first Roadster that we made, the first body, my brother and I made the plug. I really believe on the way to the molders, you know, if you look at the Cobra body, it's two halves joined by a little strip. I think we didn't secure the plug, and I think the plug got, got tweaked like this, because the first, second, and third generation bodies, they were our body, but they had a kind of a lift in the rear end, and, and guys on the internet used to call them the perky butt, right? Well, on the Mark IV, the fourth generation Roadster, you know, Dick Smith had passed away, but before he passed away, I made a deal with him. I was going to give him a Daytona Coupe, and he was going to let me scan his car. Now, for you guys, most of you guys know this, but the original 427 that this is a copy of is actually two Cobras. Original Cobra, Dick Smith was 3035, so CSX 3035. That was Dick Smith's famous Cobra. Unfortunately, Dick had raced it, and he'd been hit in the back end a lot. As a matter of fact, Dick was the one who pioneered the idea with us that don't paint a race car silver because it gets hit a lot. I don't know why it just does. So Dick's car had been hit in the back a lot, and the, the fender flares had been cut real high to get these big Goodyear slicks underneath it, race slicks, right? So we happened to have bought the remains of the contemporary Cobra company. Now, their Cobra was CSX 3042, 3042. Dick was 3035. So those two bodies were literally seven aluminum bodies away from each other from the original English box. So they were very similar. But the contemporary rear end, the rear clip, was more correct. So we used Dick's car for most of the car, but on the rear clip, mostly the fenders and the rear trunk, we used the contemporary car. So this Mark IV is a hybrid of CSX 3035 and 3042, and it's also our own car. So let's compare the 427, which is our Mark IV current production, to our Mark IV 289 USRRC car. When we had a choice to make a 289, let me get out of your way, we decided to go with, with this model. There were a bunch of different body styles. Remember, it was an AC Ace with fender flares and accommodations for a bigger V8 engine. So in this car, we wanted the more racy version. Now, a lot of guys have asked for a slab side. That's gonna require a much narrower track. Wire wheels, we might be able to do that. It's not in the plans right now. So let's talk about the differences from front to back on the 427 versus the 289. Right off the bat, you can tell on the nose. The 289 has a very distinctive nose. It has this flat lower section, oil cooler opening, and for the race replicas, they did these really cool brake duct cooling ducts. So these are actually plumbed right to the rotors. Um, 
backwards quick jacks, that's, that's, you know, personal preference. But the distinction about the 289 nose is a little bit lower, a little bit sharper, and then as you go back, dig on these fender flares. I think, Dave, this is a great example. Here's a fender flare, original 427 fender flare and 289. You can see how more bullet shaped this fender is compared to the massive 427 fender. A little bit more flare, a fatter tire. A little more narrow tire, this one's a higher profile, this is more of a vintage period correct 15 with a taller sidewall because of the car, the way it was built. Now remember, I'm going over the differences in the body shape, but they were also built to different styles. I think this 427 over here was built more like this 289 as an homage to a vintage design. Whereas this is our 20th anniversary car, I've driven this car sideways more than straight, 15, 20,000 miles on it. It's a workhorse, but it's built with a little bit more modern flair. 18 inch wheels, some other stuff. So I'll stick to the body shape first. So flares on the fenders. Now pull back and look at this really delicate, cool English uh, scoop. Now this was put on when Ken Miles was driving the car. And compare that to the big 427 hood scoop. Much bigger, wider, more air intake, beefier. I mean, this is, you know, 427, 289, broadsword, saber, you know? So we pull back, Dave. I think we'll have to go on this side of the, of the 289. Let's look at the doors, because I think you can get the door on that side and the door on this side. The doors have this really cool scallop cutout, so it's a really distinctive 289 feature. Uh, the 427 doors don't have that. They're actually a little bit bigger. Um, the 289, it doesn't look like, but it actually sits a little bit lower. These tires crank it up a bit. I mean, these vintage dry tires are big, fat tires. Um, we put the number plate light on there, like we're going to go to Le Mans, right? Um, so. The doors are a big difference. The striker plate and the innards are very similar to the 427. Remember, this is still built on a Mark IV chassis, right? So, interior. First thing you notice is the Petty Bar. You know, namesake Richard Petty. Dan Gurney used to run this. So the 289s had a bar that went from the back of the roll bar forward. The 427s has a standard tripod. They're both canted back about five or six degrees, so they have a cool kind of vintage style, but the 289 is definitely more serious. Now, if you're building a 289 USRC or FIA car, this comes with it whether you use it or not or whether you modify or not is up to you we really recommend that's part of what makes the character of the car coming backwards you've got a little different and a more delicate rear end dave maybe you can film i know the sun's in your way maybe you can compare the two rear ends if you come right up on the 427 it's wider it's 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 a little bit lower and meaner you, you can see the tires are a little bigger these are 315 or i think they're 315 tires Yeah, that's a 315.30 ZR18. Um, we had to modify the license plate because the original British license plate was a little narrower. And we had this, this so you got to put a hole saw in your license plate. On the 289, talk about a cool rear end. Remember the story of the suitcase on the FIA cars. Well, we sell this car with either the FIA squared off trunk to fit a suitcase. And in the Shelby versus, or Ford versus Ferrari movie, they showed Ken Miles, you know, being disqualified, so he hammers the trunk. I think part of that was a true story, but nevertheless, these were the dimples from the suitcase that was the FIA standard suitcase. Um, we put the bungee cord on, the USA plate. Uh, with the 289, we, we tooled up to have these really cool, you know, vintage taillights. And then what we happen to do is if you look at our current Mark IV, that's a five-year-old car. The current Mark IVs now have a different body shape in the back to accommodate these 427 lights or these single lights instead of the, the twin duels. Um, 289 gas cap, really cool. So here's your 427, you go to the pumps. Now remember we're modern, so we've got a pressure cap and a modern, and a modern cap, right? But the 289, you know, same cap design, but different location. And to be a real purist, you'd want to have a little windscreen here. Now, a lot of guys have talked about the USRC cars and the FIA cars. You know, the FIA cars uh, were, were strictly, you know, abiding by a production car standard, so they had to have a passenger seat. So here, check out the cockpit, Dave. So you've got a race seat for the cockpit, and then you've got a passenger seat that was required in FIA cars. So was the windshield on an FIA car. Now, the car that Ken Miles raced, uh, you know, was a USRC car, had a comp windscreen, it didn't have a passenger side, it had a few different nuances, but you know, this is kind of a hybrid of both, you can build it either way. So let's come back out, Dave, let's talk powertrains. Now, last time we did this, the batteries didn't exactly cooperate, so 
Um, on this car, we've got a Coyote. I brought it out just for fun. But here's, now I know I, I disparaged Weber's and I got a lot of grief for that, but I'm gonna stand by my statement. Let's see if this thing will start up. They really do sound great at full throat. But uh, at idle, they're a little lumpy. So let's see if, uh, if we'll get lucky here. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, old school push rod motor. God, it just makes you excited on a day like today. You know, I think everybody, okay, and there's a sales pitch. Everybody ought to have that one car in your garage, that special car. I mean, you, you, you go to work every day. You do your daily driver. I get it. You do your work truck. I get it. Take the kids to school. I get it. Cars are function and they're utility. But cars are dreams. Cars are the things that you go out at night, you turn on the garage door lights with the garage, the garage lights with the garage door up, you look at the glow and you look at the car. This is the car you dream of looking at. Everybody ought to have that one special car. And when guys build these cars, there's definitely a budget way to build them. It's also the right way to build them, which is the way you dream about it. So, you know, when you're worried about breaking the budget, just know you might break the budget and, and you'll never regret it. It'll be a great choice. So 427. Here's a Coyote motor. Now, I, read, I, I warmed this up about five minutes ago. Coyotes, I never have a concern about Coyotes starting. They're just, they're five O's. They just start and they run. <laughs> Like I said, like a sewing machine. It just, that was about 6,800, 7,000 RPMs. It goes to 7,700. I mean, my ears are kind of ringing right now. So, totally different animals. And when you go from the 427 push rod motor 
to the 289. They're very similar actually, just a little different tone because of the displacement, right? A lot better torque on the 427. Like I said, a gentleman's race car, you know, a little more, I don't want to say a little more delicate because there's nothing delicate about the car. Um, so we've got our 427 built to be an FE look-alike vintage 427. Our 289 USRC car, really beautiful car. And then we've got our, and which car do I put miles on and miles on and miles on is the modular motor Coyote. So which one do you like and which one is the best? It's the one that you like the best, you know? There's no proper answer. I'll tell you what, if I only had one car and you gave me any one of these cars, I'd be happy. The rest of my life, one car. But I'll tell you what, I put more miles on the Coyote. It just turned the key and run. It's also less intimidating to drive. You know, it's not an on-off switch. It has a really nice smooth power band that builds, but like I said, once you get past four or 5,000, more like five or 6,000, whoo, it's a crazy car. So Dave, that is our, our primer on our body differences. Now remember the chassis is the same. Now, I should have mentioned it. In the 60s, the 289s were built with a three inch round tube and it was 095 wall tubing. So, you know, we called it the flexible flyer for a reason. It didn't have a very particularly stiff, rigid chassis. Remember, it was from an AC Ace that was pushing 130 horse motor. So it wasn't built for the kind of horsepower that the 289s put in, and certainly not for the 427s. So in the 427s, next set, it went to the four inch round tube, 095 wall. We went to 120 wall on ours, and then we added a backbone and modern materials and CAD and everything else. So our chassis, I think Dick Smith's chassis was about maybe one tenth as strong as our Mark IV chassis. So, but remember the 289, to be a purist 289, should have a three inch round tube, and that should be in the Daytona Coupe. We left that a long time ago. So the 289 and the 427 are the same chassis, a little different aluminum panels, obviously a different body, and most people build them a little differently. I've yet to see someone put a Chevy small block or a, or a big block in a 289. It would just be antithetical, it wouldn't make any sense. Um, that car's built for that type of purpose. It is cool though, if you go to car shows, Huntington Beach was canceled. What a shame, you get 130 cars in one place, you get to see really you know, different build qualities and different ideas. That 289 comes in and it really is a little different type of Cobra. It's a little more exclusive, it's a little more rare. Um, I don't know if that matters, but that's some of the reasons why people pick it. Um, let's see, and I didn't get a buzzer to interrupt me, so I just kept talking. Um, all right guys, so uh, Factory 5 Live, it's a beautiful Wednesday. Uh, Maybe I'll give you guys an update on where we are in the company. We've got a small crew here. We're actually building cars. Uh, we're going very slow. Phones are not on. You can still leave messages and emails. Um, we're catching up on essentially five weeks of back business. Uh, you've been listening to me crow for too long, but on a day like today, I can't wait till this ban is lifted and Mad Dog and I can go tear up the local streets. And I guarantee if we get arrested, it'll be on Facebook Live. And you'll get to watch it. Uh, any questions, Dave? Because it sounds like you got nothing. Who likes the 289 versus the 427? I mean... That is one of the questions, is which one do you prefer? Me personally? Yes. Well, I, I guess it depends on what my mood is. I'm one of those lucky guys that has 17 cars, so, and most of them are for business purposes, but, you know, I built a car for Al Toon and for Al Farina recently. Two of my buddies, both named Al. They both went with that 427. It's a Windsor-based 427, so it's not an FE motor. Um, and by the way, I just did email condolences down uh, to Bill's wife, um, Bill from Southern Automotive uh, passed away. I mentioned it in one of my past broadcasts. But on a day like today, if you're going out for a cruise, um, you're going to go troll for F427 is awesome. It's mean, it's nasty. You go to a car show and it just gives you this feeling of like, I am a great white shark coming into this car show. It doesn't matter. GT500, a guy with an old Cuda, it doesn't matter. You are the king of the castle with the 427. Uh, if I had to live with one car, I'd go with the Coyote every day because it just. You know that car that, like with the big block car and even the 289, you gotta wait till the float bowl is clear, you gotta warm it up, you gotta get it running. With a fuel injected car, you turn the key and drive. So, you know, if I had a pick, I'd pick the modular engine every day. I think the power is better. It's a lot more money, um, not than the 427, but you can get a small block, a 302 for, for chump change right now. So, what else you got, Dave? How is re reliability on the 427? You know, it's been good. And, and I'll tell you what, I'm gonna plug Blueprint, but Ford performance has been the same. We had, it wasn't a 427, it was a 392 that, that grenaded on a dyno. Ford replaced it right away. They got a two year warranty and Ford's been very cool about the warranty because a lot of our guys don't get the engine installed for quite a while. So it's not like that warranty clock starts when you buy the engine. It really ought to start when you start using it. Ford's been very accommodating. And when there's been a problem, customers called us, we've called Ford Performance. What a great company. It is a great, it's still, 
you got a billion dollar company that still run like a family company, and I love Ford. Uh, blueprint, every bit is good. Uh, one of my buddies, Al, very, and, and these 427 motors are hand built. Um, they're making a lot of power. Uh, he had an exhaust valve go. He had about 300 miles on the car. He was tearing up the car, and he had broken in the engine pretty good, but he just heard this sound and some metal pieces flying out the exhaust. He shut it down. When we took it apart, the exhaust valve had, had let loose, bounced around the cylinder. Um, Blueprint took the engine back. They totally reworked it, and that engine with the dropped valve is in my car because I didn't want Al to wait, so I took, I had bought two cars, two, I had I had purchased two engines at the time, so I gave him the brand new one that I had, and they had actually done some special stuff for me, so Al ended up getting a pretty hot rod motor. They took care of me on this. They did some hand porting and stuff like that, but they're two different animals. Yeah, reliability, don't worry about it. You're spending a lot of money, but those companies really do have your back, and I'm not saying that the small engine builder is, is bad. There is a lot of small engine builders that are fantastic that, that when they shake your hand, they mean it and they stand by their products, but um, a lot of times, a lot of small engine builders make claims that they can't mate. And uh, I think Blueprint and Ford have really stood by their products and done a great job. And they deliver power. They really do. What else you got, Dave? Has anyone installed the Coyote in the 289? Yeah, you know what? I don't, not to my knowledge. I can't imagine someone's not going to because they like that style on the exterior, but maybe they want a little bit more modern, fuel-injected drivability, a little more horsepower. Um, yeah, I, not that I know of. I'll bet you if you ask Dan, uh, Dave B, Dave C, Tony, one of the guys on the phones, I'll bet he's got one. And if we had Huntington Beach this year, which we are going to have, uh, I think it's, uh, Dave, September 12th? September 12th in Huntington Beach. And I got to imagine, you know, it's almost, I'm out here, it's almost like this virus doesn't exist. And I'm not diminishing people who have lost because we have. Um, but we'll get through this and, uh, and the world's going to come back. And I remember in 2008, I learned a valuable lesson and I'm not, I'm, I'm rambling here, but 2008, people stopped buying Cobras and hot rods. Well, we had launched our hot rod. The economy was terrible. And I watched people for a year save their money, hide in their basement. And after a certain amount of time, about a year, people started buying their car. And I got the same message over and over. Guys would say to me, you know what? I'm sick and tired of just surviving and hiding. I, I'm not getting any younger. I'm gonna live my life. So I'm not saying, look, if you don't have the money, you're worried about your job, don't buy a factory five. But if you're putting it off because you're gonna save it for another day, that other day might not come. I say, live your life and we'll get past this virus. I'm one of those guys that rides motorcycles and I'd rather not live than live a protected life. I'd rather live a life and I accept risk. So yeah, I, you know, I don't even remember what the question was. What do you got, Dave? I think that's it for now. That's cool, man. You listen to me ramble for 30 minutes. Well, 25 because Mad Dog messed up the first take. Tape the blame, Mad Dog. It's always my fault. It's always your fault, exactly. And if I had Darth, he would yes. he would remind you of that, wouldn't he? Yes. All right, guys. Hey, listen, it's the middle of the week. I'm looking forward to a great spring and summer. I'm looking forward to getting back to work and building cars. Um, you guys are great, and you don't realize this. I've been talking into this phone for three weeks. Um, it's a lot of therapy for me. A lot of guys send me emails and texts and say, hey, we appreciate the daily updates. You know, the truth is, I said, if you're watching, thank you. You have helped me through this really tough time. And it's been lonely. I've come in here a lot of times, the building's empty, and there's bills to pay and things that have to be done. And uh, it may be a heavy weight, but it's a pack that I shoulder well, and, and you guys make it a little bit lighter. So I appreciate all the kind uh, words. We're doing our best, and uh, Dave out.